Hey guys, what's going on? Shaw here, and today we're back with another boss guide. Today we're going to be stepping into Necrotic Wake to look at Nalthor the Rhyme Binder. This is the ultimate final boss of the instance. This boss is quite unique because there's a lot of different situations you could put yourself in with this boss. Uh, more often than not, you probably won't have Prideful here, only because it's really difficult to back pull. You have to pretty much somehow die in the last boss, um, and then like go back in like four man or something like that. Like really wacky strats like her thing out to a low, like a nearby um, inn. So more often than not, you're actually not gonna have Prideful for here, but there's a lot of different factors you can have going into this boss. You can have hero active. Uh, you could still have cooldowns coming off of the last boss, the previous boss. Uh, you can also have different tools from the dungeon, like the different forgotten weapons, like the forgotten javelin and forgotten hammer. So there's a lot of different scenarios you can put yourself in going into this boss encounter um, that'll make it easier. Today, in this video, I'm not going to be talking about any of those strategies. They are all viable. Some people like to bring spear here. Some people like to bring a couple hammers. Um, some people grab the shield even. It really depends on your group composition. Today, in this video, though, we're just going to be talking about where you should be positioning the boss and kind of the important mechanics and what you should really be focusing on during this boss fight. So uh, let's just dive right in. So first things first, the, this boss has a few different mechanics that actually most of them you don't even need to really be aware of. Um, well, you need to be aware of them, of course, but they won't really affect you in any significant caliber. So first is Dark Exile. This is going to be when Nalthor banishes one of the players to a lower platform. Uh, upon completing the small gauntlet, the player is going to come back with a small damage buff. I think it's actually crit that they're going to come back with, uh, which is supposed to help them get the Icebound Aegis down. So that's kind of the strategy that, or that's kind of what is supposed to happen. The tank will never be affected by this, obviously, because you're tanking the boss. The other thing is Frozen Binds. Frozen Binds is a mechanic like that will never actually target the tank, so where you're standing won't matter because it's never going to be casted at you, but there will be times where you need to react to move the boss like away, uh, but really it should be on your DPS to make sure they're moving away from the boss when it's being casted on them. In a high-end setting, a lot of people have an understanding of this, but a lot of times in pugs, no one really pays attention to that cast until it's already out and on a certain player, and that's when you're going to be moving to... Um, get away from that player so they can get properly be dispelled. Um, outside of those two mechanics, though, the rest is actually going to be on the tank or the tank has to be aware of. And a lot of it actually comes down to positioning. Uh, this boss is known for doing a lot of magical damage, but first I do want to talk about the positioning of the boss. So here we are getting up to the boss. Uh, it's from my Guardian Druid's point of view. Uh, I was going to do Brewmaster, but I decided against it just because my Brewmaster is still undergeared and I'm not as, <laughs> as comfortable on it yet. So I wanted to give you guys a perspective of something that I'm pretty comfortable on, especially when it comes to damage reduction rotation. Um, so we're going to be starting at the south end of the platform, or south-ish end, I guess. It's kind of on an angle here. Um, and now is going to be at the north end. Where you pull him depends on your composition. If you have more range in your group, you probably want to pull him over to a wall. Um, if you have more melee in your group, let's just say four melee or more, so four or five melee, including yourself, uh, tanging him in the middle is probably the most appropriate for uptime purposes. And I'll get to that in a second. So as you see at the start of here, I'm actually going to be tagging him with Moonfire, and I'm going to be dragging him over to the right side of this platform, similar kind of on the north end. Um, which wall you pull him to doesn't matter. You could tank him exactly where he's standing if you have a way to get to him quickly. Um, I like to pull him off to the right so the range can go to the left and we all have equal travel time. Um, pulling him all the way to the entrance or where you spawn means that the range have to then run out before they can actually start doing damage. So pulling him, as long as you're not pulling him to where you start at, it's probably the best. So before I get into Icy Shard and how much magical damage it does and how you should be rotating your cooldowns, let's just talk about general positioning. So the reason I pull him off to this wall here is for Comet Storm. The Comet Storm mechanic is going to make you um, move or you're probably going to die. Uh, it's, it's a force movement effect that you're going to need to uh, pretty much obey the laws of or the nature of. And the reason I pull him over to the wall is because I'm allowed to then hug this wall, giving melee the maximum amount of space, the two melee that we have, where they can keep up time on the boss to make sure that they're getting the Icebound Aegis down. So we're going to see that here in a second. He's typically going to cast two Icy Shards on pull following a um, Frozen Binds. He's going to then cast two more um, Icy Shards, and then he's going to typically follow it up with uh, a Comet Storm followed by Ice, or not Ice Bound, sorry, Dark Exile. So really quickly, Frozen Binds, uh, Dave does not move here. So what that means is that I need to move out away. Um, moving this way, there's not much room over here, so instinctively I'm going to move to where there's a lot of room and where the melee can still hit him. So Cutilate and I are both going to be running out to the right-hand side here, as you can see. 
egg is then going to dispel him and then we're going to just kind of move him right back into position there is quaking active this week um of the recording of this key so we do also have to be in uh careful of that mechanic as well not to clip each other and then we're going to just try to reposition him back here so for comet storm the idea with this is that i'm going to just run along the wall here and this should in theory give the the melee enough room to do damage uh, Dave still decides to run out, uh, Cutilate stays in though and continues damaging to get down the, the Aegis to finish that off, and then we're able to move right back in. Following the Comet Storm is typically going to be in Dark Exile where he sends players down, and then you're going to continue the same rotation of just Icy Shard spam into a Bind, Icy Shard back into a Comet Storm. So it's kind of this back and forth teeter-totter kind of effect or uh, spell queuing that you're going to see from this boss, and uh, I'll quickly talk about Icy Shards in a second. So now that Cutilate was exiled, we now have only one melee in. So Binds goes out on Sakai. Sakai is a hunter. He's way up here at the top of the screen, like off my screen. So you can't actually see him. Egg's going to dispel him right away. There are ways in this encounter to negate the effect completely. Paladins can freedom the targets uh, and it won't root them at all. And it won't dispel them at all. Uh, which is pretty cool rogues can obviously cloak of shadows you can also dwarves on the alliance side can stone form or use their uh, fire blood to remove this mechanic druids can shift uh i think hunters disengage correct me if i'm wrong on that there's a way to if, if there's a way to remove roots it works just be careful though if the root is already on you and you remove it somehow whether it's a dispel or something else it will root everyone inside the circle so if you're using one of these effects make sure no one else is inside of your circle uh this does help the healer out because they don't have to waste the global on dispelling they can focus on keeping the tank alive but the problem with this is if you're not paying attention you're going to clip someone else which is just going to kind of cause a catalyst of effects to happen which you don't want which is just dps and healers getting rooted the more people who are rooted the worse because typically ice um typically the comet storm will follow and the player will still be rooted and if the player is obviously still rooted, they're going to probably die to Comet Storm because they can't avoid it. So um, just want to be careful of that. So that's pretty much the main mechanic. So the idea is to make make sure you're maintaining DPS uptime. And as a tank player, who's going to do DPS? More DPS. The, a DPS player or a tank? More often than not, the DPS is going to do more damage than the tank. Um, there's obviously circumstances where this isn't true, but for the most part... If you can get out during Comet Storm, you want to do that to make sure the DPS can get this shield down. Because Aegis does an insane amount of damage. Now, before I talk about the entire fight, we're going to just back this up a little bit. I do want to open up a log to show you guys the damage breakdown of this fight. Because it's, I think it's important to know as a tank player where the damage is going to be coming from. Because it seems like it's a lot of Icy Shard damage, um, which is true. But it's also a lot of Aegis damage. So, let's take a look at this. So here I am in the log. Let me just make this full screen so you guys can kind of see it. Um, yeah, we'll do that. Sure. All right. So let it, let's let look at damage done, enemies, all sources, now through the Rhyme Binder. Now, as you can see, um, we, don't, we don't really have to zoom in here. It gives a better exam. Uh, it, it shows better what the damage profile is going to look like in this 19. So during this course of the fight, we are seeing that Icy Shard is obviously the is definitely a top competitor with the damage that we're taking. But if you also see, Icebound Aegis is also doing an insane amount of damage. And you can see points where there is a peak because we're getting to really, really high stacks. Typically, each one of these little humps is going to be an additional snack. So here we must have got to probably six stacks before breaking the shield. Making sure you are destroying the shield as fast as possible is extremely important because if you can, if you can tell, um, it does a lot of damage to the group. And because of the way that the fight is, like, because of how melee and range have to spread out in the fight, healers typically heal better when you're stacked. And because of this, when you're spread out and there's a lot of damage going on, healers are going to have a harder time keeping people alive. So committing things like health potions during this time, if you have lock rocks, um, any kind of defensives like renewal are all going to be really good to use here. The reason it's important to break this Aegis is because Icy Shard is magical um so a lot of tanks have a really hard time doing uh like uh, mitigating this damage uh dk's typically don't as much because of just how death strike works and obviously having ams and amz and all these other effects in their toolkit paladins are pretty decent at mitigating the damage because they also have a high healing throughput and they also have things like holy shield which allows them to block uh, demon hunters are obviously notoriously good at doing this because of their tattoos they have just passive damage reduction when it comes to magic um the big, the big tanks that are going to struggle here are Guardian Druids during certain windows when they don't have Incarn and they're out of Frenzied Regen, Monks, and Warriors. Those three tanks are going to struggle a lot during this fight, so it's very important that the healer makes sure that they're funneling. 
so much healing into them. If you can see here, 4k DPS doesn't seem like that much, right? All of it is going to be at the tank. So the healer needs to be able to sustain essentially 75% or more of this. Obviously, as a Guardian Druid, you're going to see the Guardian Druid able to probably sustain 3k HPS during this fight, or maybe higher, maybe lower, depends on the skill level or um, procs or different conduits that you're running, obviously. You're going to see them have an easier time keeping themselves alive, but compared to like a warrior who really only has spell reflect um, and ignore pain, they don't have as much healing throughput as a, as a Guardian Druid might, or a Vengeance Demon, or, her, or a Holy Paladin. So making sure you damage the Aegis down means you're going to be able to, the healer's going to be able to focus more on the tank. Realistically, I don't have any crazy good advice to handle this mechanic. It really comes down to can your healer plant to heal you enough to keep you alive through the icy shards. Let's jump back to the video and kind of talk about exactly what's going on to kind of break down the rotation of how I'm cycling through defensives and when the healer is able to actually focus on me and when I need to kind of worry about myself. So here, again, we're starting the pull. The thing to know about Icy Shard is that there will never be more than four. Four is the maximum away it can cast, and there's a way to actually break his um, his spell profile to make him cast less, less Icy Shards, but you kind of need a court like coordination when it comes to this. Things like Feign Death, things like Vanish, obviously, Shadow Meld. These effects can actually cancel his Frozen Binds and Dark Exile to put it into a spell queue, which push it, pushes back the Icy Shards, though his other abilities like Comet Storm and Frozen Binds are still going to try to cast the same amount later than the original cast. I know that doesn't make too much sense, but essentially what's happening is that you're going to push a spell back to override the Icy Shard cast, meaning that the tank's going to take less damage, which is pretty much a good thing. I, I don't know why there would be a lot of issues by delaying this. So again, things like Vanish, Feign Death, um, I I'm not sure if Invis works, but things that can can delay the Frozen Binds cast or the Dark Exile cast like those are super useful. So Rogues, obviously Alliance players who are playing Elf and then Hunters. Typically, you're gonna on average, you're going to get hit by three to four Icy Shards. And they're, depending on your versatility, depending on, you know, how many how many cooldowns you have up, damage reduction cooldowns, externals that are on you, depends on how many you're going to be able to take. So um, we're going to start from here, I guess. Uh, this pool was dropped on accident in Melee just uh cutilate actually didn't realize that it was on him we are kind of just pushing up this 19 to a 20 to see if we can do anything a little bit higher than this on a tyrannical week um so there's a little bit of an accident here so i had to move the boss but icy shards are going to get kind of sketchy here so we're going to see one here um with an absorption shield i took about 30 percent of my maximum health here the second shard is going to get absorbed pretty well and then comma storm is going to follow so because i'm topped off there's no reason for me to um hit frenzied regen and I don't have Bark Skin, but I do have double Survival Instinct still, and I have Health Pot, which is good to know. So Comet Storm, we're going to move out for just gently, not to get hit by it. Icy Shard's going to come out again. As you're going to see, I have a pretty good absorption, and it's still going to chunk me for another 20% of my health. Here we're going to see another Icy Shard take me down to about 65, and then another Icy Shard to follow is going to take me back down to 50% while my healer is healing me. Typically, the best time for the healer to top off the tank is going to be after the Comet Storm, because after the Comet Storm, it's going to just be... A spam of icy shards and like dark exile dark exile into icy shards so there's nothing else really going on typically there's no aegis up at this time and frozen binds is when they need to dispel and focus on like where their positioning is so after the frozen binds cast is typically when a tank is going to need to use some defensives like um looking at the guardian jordan specifically things like bark skin things like survival and things like renewal and health pot and frenzied regen charges so Dark Exile and the Aegis are, is out, so we're going to be taking a fair bit of damage here. So the healer is really trying to focus on keeping everyone else alive. So this is a good time as well for the um, the tank to make sure they're keeping themselves alive through damage reduction cooldowns and some kind of healing. We are kind of in a tight corner here, so we have to be very careful of Comet Storms. And then, again, back into Icy, icy, uh, icy Shard spams. So you're going to see the tank's going to dip pretty low. It's typically whenever there's an overlap with the Aegis and the Icy Shards is where the tank really needs to be careful. And those kind of overlaps is when I'm going to be saving my big things like Survival Instincts for. Because that's a pretty big damage reduction. So things like Shield Wall, um, Zen Med will be able to absorb at least one cast. The 60% damage reduction isn't too bad. Um, and then obviously you have other respective damage reduction equivalents like Icebound Fortitude and whatnot. So again, these, these Aegis, you can see how much damage the group is taking. It's whenever this is up, and it is an absorption shield on Nalathor, so it needs to break. But that's pretty much the rotation. I guess the big time is like, after the Exile, after the Comet Storm Exile is the best time for the healer to focus on you. So if you are low during this time, 
you're not going to be taking much damage. There's, you know, three or four globals that healer is going to be able to heal you up with like a healing surge or a, or a regrowth or some something. We have another drop in melee. This is not the cleanest run, but the general idea of how the fight, fight should work um, is in here. So <laughs> I hope you guys enjoyed this. Uh, it's kind of just thrown together. If you guys like these kind of style videos, let me know by leaving a like. Leave a comment down below with what boss you'd like to see me do next. Uh, I plan on getting to all the bosses eventually. I've just been super busy with work and whatnot, so I've been a little absent from the YouTube game, but I'm back trying to get more videos out. So I hope you guys enjoyed. I hope you learned something from this video, and I will catch you all in the next one. Take care.